So I joined the Navy. I went to public school in the United States. I went to the military medical school. It's given me my career. It's given me my life. And if I can repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I want to do. Someone cares about you. There's a reason why your heart is beating. You still have a purpose. Don't give up. It's important to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. You are not alone. Today's guest is the first woman to serve as the White House doctor and first Filipino to be promoted to the rank of admiral. She's gone on to found her own practice in Arizona and now hosts two podcasts. Dr. Connie Mariano, welcome to the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Thanks, Danny. It's a great honor to be on your show. Well, I know that you've always been so honoring of your father's time in the Navy as a steward. What motivated you specifically to join the Navy? Well, I'd known the Navy all my life as a Navy brat, and watching my dad serve 30 years as well as all his brothers, it, it was really the only life I knew. Uh, when I went through, I went through undergraduate school in California, and then when I applied for med school, believe it or not, out of the 30-some med schools I applied to, the only one that accepted me was the military med- medical school in Bethesda, which was a full scholarship back then. And I decided then, they said, well, which service? I said, absolutely would be the Navy. What was it that drove you to want to be a doctor um, over any other aspect of uh, naval service? I think because you can help people. I was more the support side of the house rather than the operational side. And I think in, in a lot of ways, I've always wanted to be a journalist because of people's stories. And I realize as a physician, you can ask anybody anything and they'll tell you things. They usually are fairly honest. And I think you can really impact lives significant, significantly through the medical healthcare field. And that was automatic for me to, because of my interest in people. I remember my time serving as an IDC, caring for the Marines, uh, young, healthy individuals that mostly dealt with a lot of sports injuries. And then, of course, on the battlefield, dealing with traumatic injuries from gunshot wounds and blasts and stuff like that. What was what was it like being a doctor in the fleet on board ships and at different hospitals? You know, what it was, was a, first of all, gave me a full appreciation for what our corpsmen do, your, especially IDMCs. You know, the greatest honor, I think, for a corpsman or anybody in the healthcare field is for sailors and, and the troops to call you doc. They knew, they knew you, you, you know, you, you have their back when they call you doc. And I think that's the greatest honor for them to accord you that title. But it's really working side by side with the corpsman. Uh, I was on board the USS Perry AD-15, a destroyer tender, Back in 1982 to 84, we did a six-month deployment, Westpac. And that was when women were coming on board ships for the first time. And I was very fortunate. I had just uh, finished one year of internship, so I was a baby doc, internal medicine. So I really didn't know anything. And I had a crew of 15 corpsmen, including a uh, OR tech who actually has gone on to become a professor uh, at Gonzaga. I mean, you know, this is a, it's a great story about veterans, but he's, he's a professor there as well as other uh, corpsmen who've just gone on to do amazing things after their time. And they taught me what to do as, a, as to how to be a better uh, provider of care because they got to know the troops, they got to know their corpsmen, and they were technically better than I was in terms of suturing and casting and, and all those other things. I had all the book learning, but they had the hands the hands of uh, talent as to how to take care of patients. And as you're sitting there developing those talents alongside your, your junior corpsman and senior corpsman, uh, learning these new skills, how did you eventually start to kind of set your sights on serving at the White House? That, that fell into my lap, so to speak. I think that was directed by God. I, uh, I was at my 10-year mark to pay back for my uh, military medical school time. And at the end of 10 years... I was stationed at Naval Hospital San Diego. I was with my first husband at the time, who was an attorney. And I was trying to decide whether to get in or get out. And he says, well, let's go to Palm Springs and you make the decision there. So we go to Palm Springs. We leave our two kids with my parents. And it was at this uh, legal conference at the Ritz-Carlton. I walked into the grand ballroom. He goes off to talk to the attorneys and I go over to meet with the wives of the attorneys. And it strikes me that they're all having a great life. I'm working hard, working all day at the hospital, 
taking kids at night. And I told him, I'll get out of the Navy, do my time. You make law partner, I'll be a trophy wife. And he said, oh, sure, go ahead and do that. And so next, uh, two days later, I'm back at the hospital. I asked for the papers for release from active duty, and they're sitting on my desk. And all of a sudden, my captain calls, my CO calls and says, and he doesn't know I'm trying to get out. And he says, hey, uh, I want to nominate you for this position at the White House. And I go, what position? And he says, well, I'm supposed to nominate six candidates for the position of White House doctor to represent the Navy. It's during the Bush White House, and I want to include you. And I said, well, let me call my husband. So I called him up and he says, are you nuts? You hate Washington, D.C. You know how hot and humid it is there in the summer. But most of all, they don't have good Mexican food like they do here in San Diego. I said, I thought you're going to get out. I said, OK, I'll get out. I'll get out. So I hang up. I'm getting ready to call my CO. And my husband calls me back and he says, on second thought, you have nothing to lose. You'll never get this job anyway. And it's a good resume item in case you work for Kaiser. So I always tell people the sidebar is the two most important things in your life are what are you meant to do? What is your life's purpose? And the second is who's your life partner? And you make sure your life partner is your biggest fan. <laughs> so I did divorce him 13 years later. That's a whole different story. Uh, and then I went, when I went to the White House, I was the underdog. There was no way they would pick me. The, the five other guys I was up against were a surface warfare. One guy was a SEAL team guy. One guy was best friends and going to be the the uh, the uh, the best man at the wedding of the guy we were replacing. And so when I went in for my interview with Dr. J. Burton Lee III, uh, I was so intimidated. And right before I got called in to get interviewed, I stood up, took a deep breath. I said a silent prayer because I believe in prayer. And I said, dear God, if this is meant to be, let show me a sign. So I walked into the office in, on the ground floor of the White House, saw Dr. Lee, and he had a single tan Band-Aid right across his forehead. And I thought, well, that's a sign. He's human. <clears throat> he shook my hand. He pointed to his desk right opposite us with, with the chair beside. He says, sit down, just like that. And as I was walking over to sit down there with him, I thought, this guy doesn't believe in foreplay. I was just, you know, that's before Bill Clinton became president. That's a joke I can use. <clears throat> so, so I sat opposite him, <clears throat> and he launches into my interview. He goes, why do you want this job? And because I'd seen the sign, and because I guess I wasn't going to get this job anyway, I said, Dr. Lee, it's payback time. And he looks at me like, what? I said, it's payback time. I owe a lot to the United States of America. My father was a poor man when he joined the U.S. Navy in 1946 when they had opportunities for Philippine nationals to join the U.S. Navy and become American citizens. So I joined the Navy. I went to public school in the United States. I went to the military medical school. It's given me my career. It's given me my life. And if I can repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I want to do. So I look at him and there's no expression on his face, flat affect, as we say in medicine, poker face, as they say in Vegas. And so then the next question is, what can you do here? I said, Dr. Lee, you see the three stripes on my sleeve. I was in my winter blues and I had, I was a commander. I said, three gold stripes. The longer I'm in the Navy, the more stripes they put on my sleeve, the more they put me behind a desk. I'm not a desk doctor. I'm a trench doctor. You put me anywhere in the world. I know how to take care of patients. So once again, he doesn't say anything. And I'm thinking, this is the worst interview of my life. So he stands up in the middle of my interview. So I stand up and he says to me, I don't care who we're interviewing today or tomorrow. You've got the job. I'm going to tell Barbara Bush. He walked out the door, took the elevator up to the second floor to tell the first lady. I'm standing there in the office, and Dr. Roberts, the doctor who brought me in, the incumbent and the secretary sitting there, are like, what happened? I said, I, I think I got the job. And so the act of God is this, the prayer said, is it's better than what you asked for because I stayed on. I came in to be the White House doctor under Bush. And a year and a half later, I had Dr. Lee's job and I was there for nine years. So that that's not me, buddy. It's that's that's a higher power. That's that's outside my pay grade. One hundred percent. That incredible turn of events can only be orchestrated by something that is well beyond our control, that you went from I'm going to get out and become a tro trophy wife and, and support my lawyer husband to now I'm I'm being offered a job as 
a physician at the White House to serve under the presidents, the first families, vice presidents, and anybody else that comes through those doors. What was it like working in the White House? It's actually another world. It's a different, it's like that little bubble. You get to know people as people. Uh, you try not to let politics influence you. You've got to like people and just focus on, I always call it the soul. What are they about? They're the little things are big things because it gets escalated in the position you play and you can't be intimidated by them. You got to stick with your beliefs and what you stand for because people are easily swayed <clears throat> by the, the current of what's going on and, and their purpose. And if you focus on what's the highest and greatest purpose that I'm serving, it's not about me. I would always orient my new docs and my PAs and my medics and people on my staff, I said, if you come here to serve yourself, you're, you're going to fail. It isn't about you. It's about we. It's about everybody else, not about you. And by the way, you're not the most important person here. It's the people we serve. And if you do that, you won't be disappointed. You would have done a good job. Absolutely. I know my experiences, especially post-service, brought me into rooms with a lot of influential people uh, serving as a photographer and videographer at various events. Um, and my wife always kind of teased me because I never really knew who the people of influence were in these rooms. And so I always just, I, I knew that people were people and they always wanted to be treated with some sort of respect regardless of who they were. And that's how I always kind of navigated these larger events when when working through how did you end up navigating um, navigating through the White House and not being swept away by uh, selfish ambition? I always believe that you got to realize who you really work for, and that's God. <laughs> you know, all these people are temporary. And as a physician, you know, by the way, all our patients die. You know that. We all die. So what do you do in that pro before you die? What kind of work do you do and who do you answer to? That's one thing. I think having taken care of VIPs and celebrities and three former presidents of the United States, you got to look for the human aspect. And as a, as a healthcare provider and you as a medic, knowing that you, you take care of people when they're not feeling so great. So that's a test of what kind of, what people, what they're made of, right? What do you like when things don't go your way, when you don't feel good, you're cranky, you're sick, what's your behavior? And well, you have to look behind their status, their econ socioeconomic status, their title. You got to cut through all the title titles and know who that person is. And I think that's hard. I think early on, it's not to be afraid. They're human like anybody else. And they know, you know, celebrities know when you're sucking up to them. They know, absolutely, they know that. And I think what they respect is if you can look at them honestly for their better good and disagree. And there were times with my former patients that I disagreed. I said, I would not do that. And I would disagree. And I think they respect you for disagreeing and explain why you disagree with a certain course of action and stand up for that because you're not going to be swept away with the current. You don't want them to, to get sick. You want to do the right thing for their benefit. I love that you take your calling so seriously and then also treating people like human beings no matter what their title is. I mean, I can imagine that some of them would be a bit stubborn and we're going to we're going to move beyond the White House because you've done so much more, but I'm sure a lot of people are really curious what was probably like one of the most interesting story or two that you might have during that time of your career. Oh, there were so many things of travel and, and meeting, you know, great, um, 100 countries, traveling on Air Force One. Everybody sees sort of the power and the majesty, you know, so to speak, of, of the White House, of the Air Force One, of all the accoutrements of power. But I think for me, is just knowing the first family as a family, uh, they have issues like any other family we know. It's just magnified by the media. I think of anything, it teaches you the power of the media for good or for bad or for indifferent. Everything we see here, believe, comes through our ears and our eyes through the media. So what you do is your podcast and what you do to communicate is the most powerful tool to touch lives and have belief what, peop what people believe in. So I, I've taken care of members of the media, of the press. I mean, the guys, the talking heads, the older ones, the gray hairs, I've taken care of them when we travel because the press pool travels with the president. And so the White House Medical Unit and, and, and we docs and you know the medics as well 
took care of a lot of those people. So you really, I think the joy is getting to know these celebrities on a personal basis as much as possible, as much as they will allow you to. That's, that's really amazing that that's a lot of what you took away and you, and you carry on into your current life and your current practice. Now, a little bit more personal to you, what, what did it mean to you to become the first female doctor at the White House and then also the first Filipino promoted to Admiral? I think that that was on the shoulders of so many other people before me. When I was uh, chosen to go to the White House, there were other Filipinos there. That traditionally, they served in the White House mess. So a lot of times when they would see me in my civilian clothes, because when you're on duty at the White House, we don't wear our uniforms. Uh, the only in uniform uh, folks is the military aide to the president who, who has duty that day, and they wear their uniform, they carry the football. But everybody else active duty, of which there's a large contingent, we all wear civilian clothing. And so a lot of times the civilian staff would see me in my civilian outfit on the road, and they would think I, were, I was one of the stewards because I was Filipino. And I said, no, you want to talk to Master Chief over there. He's the president's valet. They go, do you have some water for him? I said, I, I wish I did. You probably get it from the val valet. So you know what? You, you correct people. You educate people. They don't know. Uh, they, they automatically assume. And I think the funniest story I remember I can share is uh, when George Herbert Walker Bush was getting ready to leave office, he did a, uh, a meet and greet with, well, no, actually he did a little a social event with the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. And they were at the uh, the Marriott across the street from the East Wing of the White House. And I was standing in the hallway in civilian clothing with my my Air Force nurse. Actually, it was Army. Army nurse. Uh, I'm blocking on his name now. I can still see him. My Army nurse was part Japanese. Well, he was Japanese-American. And... It was, his name was Art Wallace. He's actually in Hawaii now, Art Wallace. And he was an army nurse. He was one of our, he was one of our first male nurses at the White House because typically they're female. So here I, we've got the army male nurse uh, on duty, and I was on duty at that time as the Navy doc. So Tip O'Neill comes out into the hallway, and he looks at Art, Arthur, Art, who's, who's you know very uh, distinguished looking, and he's got a lapel pin. And he looks at Art and he says, are you Secret Service? And Art goes, no, sir, I'm White House Medical Unit. This is our insignia. And so he goes, what do you do? And Art says, I'm a nurse. <laughs> and he looks, Tip O'Neill looks at him like, you're a nurse? And he looks at me and he goes, what are you? And I said, I'm the doctor. <laughs> and he just starts laughing. Because, you know, when you bust stereotypes, people go, wait a minute, wh why is that? And then he quickly, and after he realized, oh, you're the doc, he said, well, what's this thing on my hand? He, you know, he's he segued into, well, what's this? So, so I think it's funny when people do a double take. A lot of times they see me, and if I'm in a foreign country, they think I, I don't speak English. So I'm just quiet. You know, I just smile. <laughs> you can understand what they're saying. Well, I also know, like, be, being from Hawaii and having worked around medicine in Hawaii for so long, also, a lot of Filipinos go into nursing, and so for you to, to go and become an actual doctor uh, also was a subversion of, of the stereotype or the expectations that people would have of your role. Yeah, and also being an admiral. Um, my late husband, John, who was a CEO of companies, he's tall, white, tall, white, blonde guy with blue eyes, and he was a CEO of Remy Delco <clears throat> before he died. And we would go on to military bases, and he had the dependent ID card, and it said Real, Rear Admiral under under the, uh, the you know the identification. And the uh, Marine Corps guard would would look at his ID card, and they would salute, right? And they would say, "Thank you for your service, sir." He goes, he says, "I I service the admiral," and I would say, "Sweetheart, he doesn't know what that means. You service the admiral." I mean. <laughs> So he would, he, and then one time he was with the uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He would tell that story. And uh, I think it was General, it was Admiral Mullen, he, and he became, Admiral Mullen became indignant. How dare you take the, her salute for her? He says, that's not funny at all. <laughs> but he really liked, he said, that little Filipino lady's the Admiral. And people, people would laugh at that because it doesn't fit a stereotype. So it makes you double take and say, wow, it doesn't fit the stereotype. And then you have to question your stereotype, right? Where'd you get that? 
Well, what's beautiful is that you've broken so many stereotypes that people have come after you and been able to see themselves in those roles that you've managed to fill, uh, especially being promoted to an admiral in, in the White House. Uh, I, I believe I was reading an interview where you said your father actually put your... Um, put your stars on you? Yes. When we did the, in fact, the president asked, where do you want to do your promotion ceremony? I said, sir, I'd be honored if we could do it in the state dining room. And one of the reporters said, why? I said, because my people served here. They were in the kitchens and they were serving in dining rooms for many, many years. And so the ceremony, the oath of office was under the portrait of Abraham Lincoln looking down on us. And my, my, uh, my father pinned one of my shoulder boards. And when he did that, his hands were shaking, they were trembling, because the last time he did that were for the admirals that he served in their homes. So he, he died a happy man. He made master chief uh, before he retired. So I, he, would, he would say, oh, there's my admiral. And I said, well, you have more stars than I do. I have only one star. You have two <laughs> as a master chief. That's so beautiful. Uh, just the heritage within within naval families. Now, you had such an amazing military career, and after serving twenty four years, you retired from the Navy. What led you to that decision, and how did you manage your transition? That was a tough one, Danny. I was. Uh, we were waiting for the next president to arrive, George Herbert, uh, George Walker Bush, and I had already said I I would move on primarily because I'd been there nine years with three presidents. And when I started that job, my, my children were three and four, and now they were 12 and 14. And, and the final decision was I'd come home one day, and I didn't see my kids very much. And I was uh, going through some paperwork in the basement of our home in Virginia. And I found a journal uh, entry, a journal that my youngest son, Jason, had uh, worked on. And in the journal, he had written an entry in which he said, today, mommy is on another trip with the president. When she is away, the house is dark, as though she is dead. And I said, my gosh, I will never get my children back. It's time for me to move on. And that's when I, I, I put my papers in. I said, I, I'll never be able to have my family back. And so that made my, that was the final decision. That's giving me chicken skin because it's, it's a lot of decisions. It's a decision that a lot of, especially senior enlisted and officers struggle with as they're going through their career. Do I put my military career over my family as, as a lot of the Navy or military will tell you to do? It's, it's your service, then your family. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so to make that decision, again, gives, gives me chicken, chicken skin. How, how did you go about navigating that transition and reconnecting with your family? Because as you mentioned, you, you missed their childhood um, and now you're stepping into their teen years. So when, when, we, when I retired, we moved here to Arizona because I, I got recruited by the Mayo Clinic. And I think what happens is when you have a marriage that's failing, being in the service, actually deployment prolongs the marriage because you don't see them a lot. And then when you come home, you celebrate being home. So you can really stretch out that amount of time. And you don't realize you have problems in your marriage until you're with them full time and you don't want to be with them full time. And so I realized being a civilian now, being retired, that I was home all the time. There was no deployment to distract me and get, get me away from home. And I realized I had nothing in common with the husband I'd been with for 29 years. And that's when I asked for a divorce. And, and someone asked me, did you leave him for somebody else? I said, yeah, I left him for another woman. I left him for me. I said, I'm literally dying. I would, I would be in my private practice at the time. And I would interview couples. I go, well, tell me how long you two have been married. Oh, we've been married 50 years. And, and I can see how happy they are. And I said, I don't have that. Something's missing. And I was about I think I was about 47 at the time it dawned on me, and I didn't divorce till about 52. So it takes a long time. You know, I think in marriages that fail, you feel it in your heart before it goes to your brain, before it comes out of your mouth, and you say, I'm done. And I, I left him uh, right as my sons were in college. And, and it was very hard. Uh, it was very hard. My sons were upset, obviously, but they knew I was unhappy. And so we parted amicably, and he remarried. 
uh, about a year later, year and a half later, and I remarried shortly after that. And he's still remarried, and he's, I mean, he's happily remarried. And I, you know, I married the love of my life, who uh, unfortunately passed uh, after nine years of marriage in, a, in an accident four years ago. That's that's a lot of transitions to have to deal with all at once. I mean, navigating through through new jobs, uh, getting to know a spouse that that you've been separated from so for so long, and then eventually deciding to end things. How do you go go about doing these steps? And I do want to talk about about your late husband John as well. But um, if you could talk to some of the some of our listeners that are dealing with these fresh transitions of I'm, I'm now out of the military and I'm around my family, what steps or advice would you kind of give to them as they're making that transition? You know, Danny, I think it's a lot of things we learned in the military, right? Number one, the mission comes first. What am I meant to do? How do I support my family? What's my livelihood? What's my job obligation? Because we're all about responsibility, right? We're all about mission. Uh, the, the second thing is take care of your troops, <laughs> right? You look after your family, your kids, you know, you take care of that. The third one is don't burn your bridges. Who do I need to help me? And and really the hardest thing really is asking for help because a lot of us are independent. We're like, I can handle this, ask for help. And then the fourth is, is really serve a greater purpose. You know, how can I be a better person as a result? How can this transition to a new life bring out the best me or create the best part of me, be a rebirth in a lot of ways. You know, going from military to civilian life, you take on so many changes in your persona. Who's me now? After being identified as 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 active duty, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different language. They have their own rules. They have their own uniform. They have their own structure. So it took a while. I mean, I've been retired now 22 years. That's hard to believe. It's so much a part of my life. And that's why veterans, we're, we're related. I, I have this kinship. I, if you're a veteran, I love you guys. You know, we know we have the language. And I still keep in touch with many of my close friends because they're my other family. Absolutely. When you realize you spend more time with them than with your own family, they are your family, your brothers and sisters. So how do you navigate? How do you succeed? In the civilian sector, you, you learn the rules. You learn the rules of what makes makes you successful. I remember working at Mayo Clinic right after I retired, and I work, you know, beyond five p.m., beyond seventeen hundred, right? And I would be there working at night, you know, in in my office. And the jan- I got to know the janitors because all the other docs had gone home. And they, and I remember my medical director saying I would hire a veteran physician anytime because we have a work ethic. But part of that is part of us dies, doesn't it, Danny? Don't we have PTSD in different ways? You know, something in you dies when you when you give up you know, what could have been in your career in the military, your, your friends and your family. You know, we're always losing things in some way. People are dying on us. But then you say, well, who's me now? How, how do they impact me? And how do I move forward in a better way? Absolutely. I mean, that that transition out is almost like uh, being ripped away from your community completely because we generally move away from our final duty station. Uh, and if we don't, a lot of people move on in new duty stations. And so even if we were trying to maintain any kind of connection, uh, that's that's going to be lost. And you talk about like the post-traumatic stress of, of dealing with that exit out. I feel like there's a lot of stuff that does need to be addressed, but finding that mission and that support group that that you had mentioned post service is so integral. Is that what sort of started driving you towards developing the center of executive medicine and and developing that star level care? It, it was actually at the time I was serving at the White House. I remember following the president around, sitting in the hold, waiting for him as he's doing an event, taking care of present on the road and taking care of his staff, I, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to be in a practice where you're sort of on call 24 seven and you, you can do house calls and you can check on them, you know, what's going on. So that, that, what that early model of what they call concierge care developed early on in my mindset. Cause I didn't work set hours. There wasn't like nine to five with me. I, I'm, I'm always on call. I'm always on duty. I'm always responding in the middle of the night to emails and calls. I mean, that's, 
That's why I'm there. And I like that challenge. And I like knowing my patients. And so I think it set me up realizing I can work like this. And, and that's, you know, I, I've been fortunate to have worked at the Mayo Clinic, but I said, I think I want to go on my own to do that. And I hired my medic from the White House, my IDT from the White House, who was Air Force. <clears throat> and he was with me for 16 years. And it was a great way to start because he did the blood work, the EKGs, the business side, and I did the doctoring. And then, you know, things changed. He moved on. I moved forward. And now I've got a whole staff of people who are independent duty in a lot of ways. I just hired another doctor, um, civilian doctor, but I'm still looking for another military veteran to uh, form a medical corps to join me. I'm, I'm recruiting. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll definitely let some people know that, that, uh, that I still have, have contact with, that you have positions available and you're a terrific, terrific caregiver. And it really seems like you answer that calling and caring for your positions to the point where you keep your, your patient list even limited so that you don't get overwhelmed and you can provide that 24 hour access to care. Now, I know many people don't have access to that care. Um, and many doctors, patients lists are well beyond their control. How do you suggest that that patients or doctors go about seeking to optimize their own health care? It's really tough. I know I know people do a lot of telemedicine. I think number one, find somebody in your community who's a primary care provider, be it a family practice, a physician, a, a naturopath, a DO, an MD. There are various subspecialties. They're physician assistants, they're nurse practitioners. Uh, it, you don't necessarily have to see an internist. You know, usually the older, more complicated case type of patients need an internist. Uh, insurance is an issue because it's pricey, but there are concierge practices that have a monthly fee that's very affordable, what you would pay for a Starbucks, you know, your Starbucks bill once a month, you can hire a primary care doctor to do that. So it's how much you're willing to, to allocate for that. Uh, I think it's developing the relationship with your doctor so they know you. So I think more and more private practices are going through that model. And, and look, you know, Google concierge care in your neighborhood, and they'll make it very affordable for those starting off. There's, I think it's called One Medical is one of the groups that has started off with nurse practitioners or PAs. There's several, there's several groups, depending on where you live, that you don't have to spend an exorbitant amount to, to afford a, a good doctor. It, it, it really, it's about access. It's access to care. And then somebody you can talk to who can help navigate the medical system and the medical bureaucracy of getting tests ordered and, and having insurance reimbursed for that. So concierge care is, is kind of a, a new path that you're seeing that's really being beneficial to providing um, good access to consistent care. Because I know in something like a Kaiser or something like a VA where they hire a large swath of doctors, nurses, uh, care workers, there's high rotation in a lot of these fields because of burnout. Um, yeah. And so you're suggesting look into concierge care and, and what your insurance can do to provide for that? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's incredible. I never even considered that. And, and, and I'll say, Dr. Connie, I am so impressed with all of your accomplishments, not just from your naval career, but also your current practice. You've written top-selling book, The White House Doctor. You also host a pod, uh, host two podcasts, one, House Calls with Dr. Car Connie Mariano, and you just launched your second podcast, Widow's Walk, and are writing your second book. Now, you had mentioned your late hu husband, John. Um, I know that he was taken from you way too soon. How, how does helping people and giving back in this way help you? It, it, a lot of ways, helps the grieving. I do relive losing him, but I also say some good can come of that, that I'm not alone. I think the lesson is you're just not alone. You're not the only one grieving, and then we can get through this together because other widows understand what it's like when you realize 75% of married women will be widows and that there are about 700,000 new widows in this country every year who join the 11.8 million widows. That's a, that's a big club. It's a club that a lot of us never wanted to join, but it is. And so when I'm with my widow friends, my widow sisters, we can laugh, we can share stories. 
We can cry together and because they know they've been there. They can give you advice. They say you never get over it. You just get stronger. You just get stronger, but it's under your own timetable. Now, <clears throat> with, with the loss of John, uh, it happened four years ago. Obviously, you've experienced a lot of healing from them. What were some of the things that, that helped you heal and recover that, that you took uh, to heart in those early, early years? I, I looked at my faith about uh, the, the afterlife, that uh, John has not died at all, that his, only his body's away. So he's still very much present in my, in my life, in my heart. I would dream about him. And one of the first dreams I remember in that dream is we used to, he used to, we used to have an airplane. He was a private pilot as well. And except I'm in the cockpit with him, I always sat in the cockpit, but in the right seat. This time I'm in his seat and we're, I'm taxiing on our runway and in this dream, it was so, visit, so vivid, Danny, he looks at me and the most beautiful blue eyes, and he says, remember, when things go rough, keep flying the plane. Don't bail. And it was right before COVID hit. And, and right when my accountant said, you know, you don't have to work anymore because he took care of you. And I said, but what would I do? So I, I said, I, I, I'll just keep working. I need to work. I need to be in contact with people. I need to have a purpose what is my purpose? What is my mission? And I think that was the biggest lesson. What's my mission? And, and also to take care of yourself, right? And be around other people. Just be around people, your support group, your, your inner circle that believes in you, that bolsters you, that makes you laugh, that makes you is there when you cry. You have to have your, I call them the hide the body group. If you wanted to off somebody, you'd only tell five people and those five would help you. So it's your hide the body team. So you, you got to have people like that. That's beautiful and great advice. And the fact that you you have been able to implement that advice in, into your career. Because so often when we experience traumatic events or, or suffer from uh, mild to severe depression, our instincts are to do the things that are going to make us work, whether it's pick up a cold beer and, and, and have some drinks with fair weather friends uh, or alone. Um, continue to further isolate ourselves, or even just dive into almost like, almost like this workaholic nature. But you had said you focused on your mission. It just so happens that your mission is tied in with, with your work, but also in continuing to be a mother and a grandmother for your children. So how do you go about finding the motivation to do so much when you have the permission to, to sit back and just kind of let life happen? I always believe we're put here for a reason and that my reason was to help people. Uh, I, I'm blessed to have wonderful sons. Uh, they're both married. I have wonderful grandchildren. My oldest son actually works with me. So I see him every day in the office. He does the business support side. Uh, I see my other son who works for General Mills in Minnesota. I see them every couple of months with the, their newest baby, my newest grandson. And then I've got a small circle of very close friends. Uh, and I've got my veteran friends who live in Arizona who I see every couple of months. So I think that really helps. The other sort of interesting side of it, and I've shared it online, is I've got friends who are mediums. And depending on, you know, I always ask my patients, do you ever get signs that your loved one's with you? And they'll, they'll look around. I say, no, it's sort of weird, but I think, I think I've sensed him. Or I've, I said, have you ever been to a medium? And actually, I, I probably should do a podcast. I'll do it on Widow's Walk one time. I, I'm inviting my my local medium, uh, Michelle Claire from Gilbert, to come and visit. Uh, I've She's read for me several times. John comes through loud and clear. Uh, another good friend of mine is Suzanne Giesman, who is a Navy veteran, was a commander. Uh, Suzanne Giesman has written many books about her journey. Uh, she was the personal aide to General Shelton, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, she lost her stepdaughter, who was uh, active duty Marine Corps uh, at Cherry Point. Her daughter, Susan, died uh, by lightning, struck her by lightning, lightning several years back. And that led to Suzanne Giesman's journey to become a medium. And she is the most unlikely person you would think would become a medium. She's married to Ty Giesman, who is a sh former Navy ship driver. And I just saw her uh, on Alaskan cruise um, a few weeks ago, and she had 550 people on that cruise who were dedicated to attending her workshop uh, called The Awakened Way. And 
she channels spirit in a lot of ways. And we, you know, people sometimes think that it's made up, but I always think if I believe that I, I in a lot of ways can connect with my husband or people can help me connect and, and it gives me tremendous comfort, I see no harm in that. I mean, I still go to church. I'm Catholic by upbringing. I go to uh, my Catholic church and I go to Unity Spiritual. And, and so that's the spiritual side of believing that, our lives are only for a short amount of time in this world, but your soul goes on forever. And that those who have left us in this life are still present in many different ways. And I also believe you don't, you don't meet people by accident that they people in our lives come into our lives for a reason. And our, our challenge is to determine why is that person in my life now? What am I meant to learn from them or what am I meant to do for them that can make a difference? I think so many people in this world can relate to the comfort that's found in knowing that our loved ones, uh, when they're gone, aren't truly gone and are continuing to watch over us uh, as life continues for us here on earth. Um, it still continues for them in an afterlife. And as we bring the episode to a close, uh, I wanted to ask you, as, as we know, many veterans, junior enlisted to flag officers, struggle in life, especially life after service. And all too often, these struggles lead to death by suicide. Is there anything that you would like to say to spread hope to someone that's currently going through a struggle? You have to really believe that you're meant in this life to be a, for a reason, that your suffering may end temporarily in this life, but realize everybody left behind how much they love you and how much they value you. And that if you could do it, one last thing for, uh, for others, stay in this life, get some help before you decide to exit this life by your own hands in a different way. Just pause and realize how many people love you and want you to still stay here and get some help. Get some help really so that you can stay with us longer and don't leave us so soon. Well, Dr. Connie, you are incredible. Uh, you have so much wisdom to continue to offer. If anybody is looking to follow you and your work, where can they go to get that information? They can email me. I'll give you my my email. Uh, just go to just my doctor m y d o c t o r at d r c m a r i a n o dot com, or just Google me, and you can find me on on Voice America Network on my house calls podcasts or widow's walk. I'm happy to connect with others. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on the One Mile One Veteran Podcast. Thanks, Danny, for all what you do. God bless you.